What is up, Fountain students? Um, I am actually hollering at you live from, or not live because this is pre-recorded, but I'm in the sound booth at the church because why not? Um, this good lighting from the um, from the um, stained glass windows. Um, uh, that does not say welcome. That that is our welcome sign, and for some reason this reverses it, so maybe it will look appropriate in your video. It looks ridiculous over here. But uh, everything's backwards, so we're, I'm over here at Fountain Church. Uh, it is Wednesday, the week two, or at least the second Wednesday night of me not seeing you guys. And uh, I really don't dig this, um, but right now we're trying to connect and hopefully leave you guys something to, um, to take with you while we're away from each other. Um, I'm going to be looking off to my left, your, probably your left now because everything's backwards. Um, cause I do have some notes that I want, that I don't want to miss while I'm giving you guys. I want to make this, uh, devotion efficient. Um, and, um, hopefully leave you guys something that you can hear and that you can, um, take with you this week. Um, a quick announcement. I'm going to try to set up a zoom meeting for us next week. So I won't be doing a devotion. We'll hopefully just get together and be able to talk and catch up. Um, so look for that on remind one-on-one. Um, and every other avenue that I try to get in touch with you guys. But um, anyway, here we go. We're going to be uh, hearing from John 12. I'm going to scoot over my computer here. And I'm just going to read you this little story about Mary anointing Jesus at Bethany. And this is a popular story because it displays someone who's, whose passion and who lo whose love for Jesus is really, really great. And a lot of times we take this as a as an example of how like we're supposed to, to act around him. And I think that's an accurate uh, interpretation and accurate application, but I want to get to a few points and, and really let's see how the depth of what is happening in this story. So this is uh, John 12 verses 1 through 8, and I'm going to read these quickly, <clears throat> um, but it's, it, it, this is what it says. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has ra had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Um, we think the him is Jesus. It might possibly be that it was for Jesus and Lazarus because Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Um, Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table, picking up in verse 3. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone, that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. Okay, in our kind of 21st century... Um, I hate to say social justice climate in the church because uh, I think some of it's necessary, but there is a social justice climate in the church. And so for Jesus to say something like, well, the poor you're always going to have, so like you need to be paying more attention to me, uh, we, we, we get to the place where that causes really some cognitive dissonance in our minds, um, meaning it doesn't really mean, or, or we hear Jesus saying something, we're like, why would, why would he say something like that? Well, we need to, let's get into the details of the story, and I think there's an application here that, that really does express a, satis, a satisfying reason for what Jesus said, and also a really appropriate example and, a, and an appropriate application that we can take from it. So let's just get some details and, and kind of see the background here because this is a historical narrative this is not a sermon that Jesus has given this is a story that's being told about something that happened so a little background information number one this happened six days before Passover so this story starting in John 12 and for the rest of the book of John will cover the last week of Jesus's life this is kind of weird the, the, the synoptic gospels Matthew Mark and Luke uh, the last week of Jesus' life takes up anywhere from about 15 to about 25% of the book. Half of the book of John is dedicated to that, last, to that last part of his life. So, again, we're seeing this kind of biographical thing emphasized in the book of John. It is about who Jesus is 
And the last part of it is specifically about who Jesus is in relation to what he did. So everything is leading up to Christ's crucifixion on the cross for the sake of sinners. Um, and, and really, John's probably motivating um, factor for, even put, for, for putting this whole book together was to demonstrate Christ's um, work during that last week of his life. So this is a hugely important part. Um, we've already said Jesus is a dinner at Lazarus' resurrection. And here's where the big event happens. Mary anoints Jesus' feet. Now, a couple, a few things are happening that are a little different here. Number one, this, this anointing oil, if Mary is hosting this dinner, which because she lived with her sister and Lazarus most likely, um, she probably would be considered a host. Well, normally the host would anoint the guest's head. If there was a guest of honor... They would come in and you just get a little, a little bit, put it on their head, and that was their way of honoring the guest. Oh, Mary just pours it out on his feet. Um, and there's a few things going on here. Number one, this was a very humiliating act that anyone in the first century culture, we see this when Jesus washes his disciples' feet later, but that anybody in a first century culture would even bend down to, to touch really the dirtiest part of somebody's body in that day and age. Right? We, we kind of, regardless of how you feel about coronavirus, we get the whole deal about we don't touch people because we can get sick. Let's back this up 2,000 years. E. coli, staph, strep, that's a whole lot more damaging and a whole lot more deadlier. Um, and that's what people carried around on their feet. So as we're kind of in this kind of like medical, medically <laughs> induced new way of living around here. I think the fact that it really hits home now, the, the seriousness of actually physically touching somebody, the dirtiest part of someone's body. The reason is a lot of people you know, walk around in sandals, walk around barefooted, you walk everywhere, and everywhere wasn't always clean, okay? Um, for those of us who have been in some foreign mission environments, when we've been in places, it literally, we, we, we've had to be We've had to go places where they said, do not touch anything because the, the diseases on it will kill you. Um, and that is the reality that these people lived in. So Mary, instead of anointing the head, generally the cleanest, the cleanest part of the person, she goes right for his gift. She humbles himself, or his feet. She humbles herself so that she might pour out this offering on the most humble part of Jesus' physical body. Okay? This is an expensive gift. When, uh, when Judah says you could have been sold for about 300 denarii, she pours a pound of this essential oil, literally, um, on Jesus' feet. The most of your commentaries call it spike nard. This might have been a relation to frankincense um, or myrrh. Sorry, myrrh. This is the burial perfume. Um, essentially, 300 denarii the, the, the Jews were complaining about was about a year's wages. Um, so do with it what you will. Average income in LaGrange, where we live, is $33,000. This was a year's wage of, of worth of perfume. Now, she doesn't give all of it. it and the reason I say that, Jesus makes this comment later in, in, the, um, in, in the, this passage where she is allowed to keep some of it. He rebukes Judas and says, let her hold on to it. But she pours out a ton of it. So this was something that was probably saved up for a very important purpose. More than likely, it was the family's inherited burial perfume. So it was going to be, this is kind of an insurance policy that they had. Well, she was giving it to Jesus. Um, and it is very, and this gift that she gives him is very unselfconscious, okay? Um, and that's kind of a popular thing in the church. Like, I'm going to be undignified for the sake of God. Um but keep in mind, like she, this is a serious price that she is paying to pour out this type of worship onto Jesus' feet. For Mary to let down her hair in public was a very not appropriate thing to do. It was basically willful humiliation. Um, and we even Paul even mentions this a little bit. Um, the 1 Corinthians eleven fifteen talks about the long hair of the woman is the woman's glory. This is her pride. This is what what is is beautiful about her. It is it's not like chauvinistic or anything, but it was just one of the things in that culture. They were like, she has lovely hair. This is a a, a crowning beauty. Uh, we would place that kind of emphasis on like physical fitness or something like that today. In this case, it was Mary's hair. 
And she, I do, I've heard this illustration used uh, dozens of times, and it's been passed around uh, discipleship circles, but she took what was her highest, her, her public beauty, her crowning glory, her generally what would see, be seen as her best, and laid it at the lowest part of Jesus' physical body. My utmost for his highest is like a, it's a devotional book. This was her utmost for his lowest. It is that like lack of self, like total self denial, that that was one of the mark marking um, facets of this worship that she laid out for him. Judas corrects her. Jesus rebukes Judas. Judas is like, "Well, you could have saved that money and given it to the poor." And Jesus is like, "No, this is for my burial." First of all, Jesus was announcing what was about to happen to him, and it went over Judas's head, obviously, and probably went over everybody else's head too. But Jesus makes a really, really impressive statement here that he would tell Judas, stop worrying about the poor. Forget, like, just forget whether he's calling Judas out because Judas was a liar. That's fine. Everybody knows Judas was a liar, but Jesus corrected the statement that he made. He said, you're going to have the poor with you. This is for me. I'm not always going to be with you, and this is for my burial. Listen, Jesus did make a point that he is more important than our human interest. Judas could have picked any number of things that, that that oil could have been invested in. This is for the hungry. This is for the poor. This is for the temple. This is for the church. And Jesus said, no, it's more important that it be poured out on me. What's the point? And really quick, because I got like three and a half minutes. For the Christian, Jesus is the focal point of our lives. Okay? Everything that we are do that we do is supposed to be targeted around him. Christian, why are you in school? So you can minister to people in school and so you can equip yourself to do ministry outside of the school once you're in a, once you're an adult. Whether it's Christian school or public school. We're just we're talking about your maturity for the sake of the gospel. Christian, why do you go to church? For your maturity for the sake of the gospel. Christian, why do you have friends? Why do you do sports? For your witness, for your maturity, for the sake of the gospel. Everything that we do revolves around that focal point of advancing the cause of Christ into the world. He is the focus of our treasure. Christian, what are you going to do so you can get paid, so you can invest in the kingdom? Christian, why do we give offerings? Christians, like, why do we donate? Why do we send people and money to Uganda so the gospel can be advanced? Why do we give to the church so the gospel can be advanced? Why do we, and here's where this whole tension between the poor and the social needs come from, why do we even give to social causes. Ultimately, for the Christian, it should be so that the gospel can be advanced. It's the focus of our services. If I give you a warm meal but don't give you Jesus, I have made you comfortable to an eternity of separation from God. That does you a temporary good with an eternal evil. And if the Christian doesn't realize that Jesus is the main focal point of our lives, we fail those that we try to serve. And Jesus corrected Judas rightly on that. Jesus, Jesus uplifted Mary rightly on that because her passion, her focus, her love was on him. And with that passion and that focus and that love being zeroed in, cross-haired on Jesus, then the motivation for everything she does is for the proclamation and the glory of God. In which Jesus is going to say later, if you lift it up, he'll draw all men to him. That dedication and that focus is worthy of the life and worthy of the humiliation and worthy of the sacrifice that Mary made to him. And that same truth applies to Christians. Now, for us, his glory then is worth our very lives. If our laser focus is on Christ, then our lives should echo that same focus. So just as we continue in this new normal, as you continue in social interactions or social disinteractions or whatever it is we do, as you continue to like try to get together with the church, what is the motivating purpose behind that, Christian? And this is for this is for um, believers. Like, are you doing this for the sake of Christ? Is your speech, is your treasure, is your time, is that honoring Christ? Non-Christians, this is what was laid out for you. This was the value of the Savior that ultimately gave his life for you. And it should be the focus of your life as well. Trust him, repent, of your, repent and 